Amen. All right. Redemption. Redeem. We don't use that word very often. Um, But like the only analogy that I think I can think of to like our common thing is like you redeem a ticket, right? Like you go to like Chuck E. Cheese or something, you get a bunch of tickets because you're really good at skee ball or whatever, right? And then you go up to the counter, you can redeem it for like a little water gun or a little slappy hand or, right? Like, and, and, and so it, you, you can't, like, it, and it's like there's like 2,000 tickets and 10,000 tickets. And I remember as a kid, like, you know, do you save up your tickets and then redeem them all? Or do you, you know, go for like the gumball for five tickets, you know? Um, major decisions. Um, that's redeeming, right? It, it, it costs you something, right? Like these tickets you don't get to keep. Um, like you got you to gotta exchange the ticket for, to get something in return. And religion proper, like when you think of religion and the other religions of the world, there is redeeming going on. But it's a redeeming where it's like you bring your works and your efforts and God rewards you. That's what, that's what all the world religions teach, that, that there's some sort of ethic, you, like you have to do something, and then God gives you something back. That is not the gospel. And that is not what is taught in God's word. It's the exact opposite of that. That we're the things being purchased. That God is the one that is sacrificing and giving and it's costing God to redeem us. You see how it's completely opposite. And so when we talk about the gospel, that's why it's so powerful, so different. That's why we say it, it, you can't be saved without Christ. Because Christ is the ticket. He's, he's the redemption. He's the one that spilt his blood, that paid the price for us to be purchased. We're the slappy hand. We're the water gun. God's purchasing us. He's redeeming us. And he redeems us not just in this. And so when we, when we go through Ruth, right, like, like there's this whole, there's a bunch of different layers of redemption that we've talked about so far, right? And there's like, there's a cultural redemption. There's the the, the, and we talked about it last week, right? Like, like in Israelite customs, society, there was this responsibility of the kinsman redeemer and that they had this obligation to do this. Okay, so, so put that over here. Like there's this custom, this Israelite custom of kinsman redeemer that, that frankly we, we no longer adhere to. I, don't, I mean, I don't think so for the most part. I mean, we, maybe we try to reach out a hand to our, our relatives, but there's no real like, it's not a central point of our society, right? But then there's this also redemption that's going on in the story of Naomi and Ruth, right? Like them personally. Like what's happening to their lives? And God's like taking tragedy and he's redeeming it, right? Like he's, he's purchasing kind of their, their tragedy and their dire circumstances and making it better, okay? So there's like a second like kind of redemption that's going on there. But then there's, there's a third redemption that we look at and we see that Boaz is this Christ-like foreshadowing, right? Like that he's, that he's representing Jesus. And we're going to see that more today as he kind of fulfills the, the, the end of the story. And so there's this, there's this big picture redemption, like eternal redemption that we have in Christ. And there's a fourth redemption in this thing in that he redeems Naomi's poor decisions and Ruth's poor decisions, right? He, he redeems our daily actions and lives, like, kind of like Larry was just talking about, right? We, we mess up all the time. And God somehow, some way, takes our mistakes and failures and failings and redeems them. He, it's like he, he picks up the trash that you leave behind and so we see this just over and over, this picture of redemption. And it's so fundamental to the gospel. Like, I would just encourage you, like, just dwell on that word. Because the question that we all should be wrestling with every day is, do I need to be redeemed? The answer should be yes. But it's really easy for us to start thinking that we don't need to be redeemed, that we are our own redeemers, right? That, that we don't leave a mess behind us, that our decisions are right, 
And we've convinced ourselves that we don't need God to redeem us, that, that we are good enough in and of ourselves. And again, that's not what the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches that we're depraved, that we're sinful, that we're rebellious, that that <laughs> that, that verse that we sang, that we're, I mean, what an what a incredible verse, and I'm going to really try to quote correctly this time, that we stole God's breath and sang our own song. I mean, isn't that it? Think of how much stuff we talk about that is meaningless, you know? And so what we have is this, this beautiful picture of God, like, wanting to redeem us. And he, and he walks through this in the book of Ruth. Um, so I'll just, I'll just kind of bounce through, right? We went through Ruth chapter 1, 2, 3, and then to this morning we're going through Ruth chapter 4. In Ruth chapter 1, that he conforms all things to his will, right? Like our tragedies, our horrible things that are happening in our lives, the circumstances, he conforms them. He, he redeems them by conforming them to his will for his glory, and you're good. That, that could be the end of the book at that point, and we go, praise God. And then we saw uh, in chapter two that, that God works through our relationships to reveal himself to the world. That, that the person sitting next to you and behind you and in front of you and the person that you sit next to at work, how you interact in those relationships is how God is going to reveal his son in the world. That should sit heavy. That should feel like a responsibility. I don't know another way to say that. It, you don't need to say certain things in order to reach heaven or anything like that. It's not workspace, but you should feel as though you have a responsibility because you are what? An ambassador for Christ. And I'll read that later. And then last week, we saw that our decisions, there's a lot of things that can cause us to make decisions in different ways, and our decisions should be led by our faith. And we saw that between Naomi's decisions and Ruth's decisions, and then Boaz reflects this great decision to be the Redeemer. And again, we'll dissect a little bit more of that. So this morning, we're going to... Um, well, I'm not really going to start in Ruth chapter 4, but um, we're going to back up a little bit. Because what we need to understand is that our God is a redeeming God. That's who he is. This isn't something, this is consistent throughout scripture. We see this with Israel. We see this throughout. That is a characteristic of our God. And so the book of Ruth is intended to show us and communicate to us all of these different aspects of God's redeeming grace. And it's tough, and I, I, it's a narrative. It's a story. But it's not just like a bedtime story or a fairy tale or anything like that. It, it, this, and so I think it's worth saying this because I will tell you, it's very hard to preach through narrative. <laughs> Because it's difficult, because you're like, we start by, by believing that scripture is inspired by God, right? Okay, so we start there as our, as our foundation, that God breathed out the words that are in scripture, and we can have a whole other discussion if you don't believe that, um, but, but that's, that's what the Bible teaches, that's what we believe, right? That, that this is the word of God, and so everything that's in here is for what? Our correction, our rebuke, our encouragement, right? Like, it teaches us, this is how God speaks to us. Okay, um, And so then God writes a story, <laughs> the book of Ruth. And then we have to ask, why? What is he trying to teach us in this story? That's not true for every story, right? It did, like you could tell any story and there could be a great moral lesson, but that's different. This is God's inspired word. And so we, we read the book of Ruth with this eye towards why. Why is he saying that? Why is he doing Why? Why is that part of the story included, right? And we saw this, right? Why are relationships such an important part of the story? Why are the dynamics between Naomi and Ruth so important? There's a, there's a purpose to it, right? Because God's teaching us in this. But it's also, we got to also be careful with narrative is that we often use the characters and we go, I want to be like a Boaz. That's not the point of it. And if, we, and if we see that in biblical narrative, we're missing it. David and Goliath, 
the, 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 the summary of that is not be like David, don't be like Goliath. It's about God. Right? Every one of these stories teaches us more about who God is, his characteristics. And so if we're coming off at the end of this book of Ruth, and I say all this because we're going to close Ruth today. And other than your small groups will like review it, like that, that's it. You know, I'm mean, like, you can go back and read it anytime you want. But, but like, that's it. So what do we get out of it? A nice little story that we can remember? A fairy tale? Because it's easy to remember the storyline, right? Like, you guys all should be able to walk out of here going, here's the storyline. That's not what God wants you to remember, though. What God wants you to remember is who he is. He's a redeeming God. All right. So I hope that in your groups this week, um, and in your own personal study, I hope you saw something that's really cool in, like, this. There's a lot of people that say, like, the, the author of Ruth. Maybe Samuel, I don't know. We'll read a verse today that makes me think maybe it's not Samuel. But um, the author of Ruth is, is a, man, I don't want to overstate it, literary genius. I don't know. Some people will be like, you know, like over the top, like this person was amazing. I think it's a little silly. But, but it's good. There's some literary devices that are going on here. And I, I want to kind of start off with, with this first one because we, we hit it this week. So um, if you would... Um, Turn to Ruth chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 13 here. And as you're turning there, I want want us to review what Naomi's plan was and what we covered last week. Naomi's plan was rash, right? We saw that, like, the harvest was ending. She felt like she needed to execute something, and so she made a decision. Um, It all happened at night. It happened in the dark. I'm just this is, this is where you take narrative and you go, what's God teaching in here? So you might disagree with some of this, but I, I think this is pretty obvious. So, so he goes, it's rash. She does it in the dark. She says, go, wait till he goes to bed, right? Go there privately, right? She doesn't take somebody else with her. Naomi doesn't go with her, like, right? It's, so it's, it's rash, it's secretive, it's in the dark, And what did we spend? And and probably in your groups, you're like, man, it's questionable, right? We spent a lot of time going like, what were the intentions? What's going on here, right? Like, I mean, honestly, you you really can't read chapter three without going, what? Right? Like, it's it's weird. And you you wonder, what was... What was Naomi thinking? What was Ruth thinking? And there's all this kind of, it's all, everything gets muddled. All right, so take all of that, that package. And, and what, he, what God does here is he sets it in contrast, okay? And look at what, what we read in, in uh, Ruth chapter 3, verse 13. Boaz says, remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So Boaz doesn't like rashly take advantage of the opportunity and say, let's go elope. Let's button this thing up, right? Like I think we could all say that like, I think Boaz was interested in Ruth. (laughs) Like I think think he was like, sweet, this is awesome, right? Some young lady, she's interested in me. He's single, he's been single his whole life, right? Like, so I I I think there's a genuine piece to this, but what does he do? He doesn't act rashly. He's patient. He's like, hey, we're going to go in the morning. There's actually somebody that's closer. We're going to be diligent about this. We're going to slow things down. We're going to make sure everything's prim and proper. Right? And that's what he does. And so what does he do? He waits till the morning. What happens in the morning? The sun's out, right? Like, like there's some light now. You know, there's, there's something else going on. Turn over to Ruth chapter 4, verse 1. It says, now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. So he goes to the gate. The gate is like the public square, right? Everybody's there. There's at least ten men there, right? And he, and he goes there and he sits down. He's not, he's not in a rush. He's not like, hey, I need somebody to, 
Dude, watch this. Like, we're, we're doing this like, uh, what is it called? A shotgun wedding? <laughs> is that right? Like, it's not like this real rash thing. He's not trying to, like, make this happen. He's like, hey, let's just, let's slow down, work through this. And he goes, hey, 10 of you, 10, 10 people. Wouldn't two have worked? Four, five, but 10. There's nothing scripturally that says you need to have 10 people to agree to a matter. This is like, overarching, like, he is putting this out so everybody knows what's happening. It's in the light. It's in the morning. It's super public. Okay? You guys with me on this? Doesn't this seem very contrasty to what Naomi did? And then look at what it says in verse 7. Now we're picking up on our verses this week. It says, so, (laughs) it says, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. So there's like a little, there's this little like interlude of like academics. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Okay. (laughs) Right? Like, That seems very descriptive. Like, why did we need that piece of information there? These are the whys. When you're reading a narrative, why? Why is that in there? Why could it not just have kind of gone by? It's very legal. This is a legal transaction. Incidentally, this is maybe when I read this this week, this is why I was like, man, maybe Samuel didn't write this because he says, what does he say? This was the custom in former times sounds like it was a long time ago, right? But I don't know, just my conjecture there. Samuel would have been pretty recent. But, so, but he's like, it's legal. This was how the transactions worked, right? Like if you ever bought a house, you're like, you go to the title company. Here's how the transactions work. You sit there all day. Um, you sign a billion times. You don't even know what you're doing. They have you a sack of paper, right? Um, so he's trying to make it very clear that this is very legal, it's in the light, it's public, it's very legal. And then look at what uh, we read in verse 9. <clears throat> then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought. And then I'm going to keep reading this, but listen to what Boaz does. He's like, here are the terms of the agreement. I'm going to just lay it all out here so there's no questioning of my motives or my purposes. You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Also, he's like, also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. This is, I mean, Boaz is like, I'm just, this, is, this is what I'm doing. I'm buying the land. I'm going to marry Ruth. And he's got, and it even says, right? It's like the 10 elders and all the people. So like, here they are, like people are walking into the gate, right? Everything is all this hustle and bustle coming into the city. And all these people are like turning aside to watch effectively a marriage ceremony, right? Like this transaction that's happening. When you finish reading this, is there any question to Boaz's motives? There isn't, right? It's like, okay. Clearly, this is what he wants. So I I think that there's this huge contrast between light and darkness. Between Decisions that can be made this way and decisions that can be made this way, right? Rash, secretive, dark, questionable motives. Transparent, clear, in the daylight, public. This is how, this is how we live lives that are above reproach. Because we let people see us. We don't hide us failings, right? I mean, certainly there would be people. I mean, imagine if Boaz had taken advantage of the evening encounter for the rest of his life. He was, he was a worthy man, 
And people would have been like, yeah, Boaz, super worthy man. You know, I'm not exactly sure what ended up happening with Ruth, but I guess, I guess they got married at some point. I don't know really what happened that night. But that's not what he does. He lives above reproach so that people can say, this is what he did and why he did it. So why did Boaz do it? <clears throat> well, he wanted, he wanted Ruth. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, let's just be honest, right? Like, he wanted to be married. But there's more to it. In fact, if, if you remember this week's reading, there's this other person, the other redeemer, never named by name. It's really interesting. Scholars think that, that really... Like, that other redeemer failed to live up to the standard of that society. That other redeemer, and if you remember, it says that he was concerned about um, uh, different words, destroying his inheritance or, um, I can't remember even what the text said, but basically um, harming his inheritance. In other words, like, he had kids or he had land and, like, to bring on Ruth and Naomi would be like, it, it'd be messing things up. It'd be bringing another person into, into their life. And, and he's like, man, just not. Like, I spent my whole life building this. I'm not, I'm not about to, to make everything messy. You see, it's going to cost to redeem the land and Ruth. It's going to cost. And it's going to cost Boaz. There, there's, a, there's an actual price tag. He now has this land. He has to take care of the land, right? Bring Ruth in. I mean, sure, yes, it's great, you know, but Naomi comes with Ruth, right? He's immediately got a, a, a mother-in-law that's living with him that's a widow, and, and now he's got to care for, I mean, this isn't just caring for Ruth, right? Like, it's caring for Ruth and Naomi, right? Like, like there's some complexities to this, and the other redeemer chooses his own estate, chooses his own life and says, I don't want to enter into that mess. I don't want to mess up my inheritance. It's just not worth it to me. And, and so his name is stricken from the record. And we don't know who it was. But Boaz enters into this mess. It's not just perfect. It's not just great. He isn't just getting married. There's more stuff that's coming with this. See, he knows that this woman, that these women need redeeming. They have a need, and he can provide for that. There are people in this room, there are people in your lives that have needs, right? And we often stand there and go, man, I just don't want to enter into that mess. It's the reality. It's going to take up our time, our energy. It's going to mess things up. It just gets emotionally exhausting. We like relationships that are easy. We like relationships that feed us. We like relationships that we feel like we get out of it. We don't like the idea of sacrificing for a friendship. In fact, I think you could probably say that most people would say, oh, a friendship is somebody that like, you just get along with and you don't ever need to sacrifice for. It's like, no, not biblically. Culturally, probably. Right? And that's what our culture defines friendships as. And so Boaz makes this sacrifice. And this is why he's this example of, of redemption, right? We start to see this foreshadowing of Christ in Boaz's life. Here's, and we realize this in a small group, actually, I think my wife did, and I corrected her, and then I was wrong, which is good. Um, do you know who Boaz's mother was? Rahab the prostitute. <laughs> You see, I think Boaz knew what it was to be redeemed, right? He, he certainly knew the story of his mom. <laughs> and how, like, 
She didn't go out and just start worshiping God. (laughs) Spies (laughs) rolled into Jericho, right? Like there was a door of opportunity that opened up. And Rahab responded correctly. She just responded correctly. And God redeemed Rahab. And so when you look at this and you see Boaz knows that story, he's seen what that looks like. He knows that his circumstance, he wouldn't even exist if this didn't happen. And so we have this beautiful picture. And so Boaz is sitting here going, I'm going to redeem Ruth because I know what that is. You see, I think this is the problem for us. I think a lot of us don't know what it is to need redeeming or we think we don't know what it is. And then when things go sideways in our lives, we wonder where all of our friends are. We wonder why people aren't loving us and caring for us the way we'd want, but we've never done that either. And so we have this whole society, and I'm not trying to like pontificate, I guess I am a little bit, but I, we have this whole society where it's like we just don't, like our relationships are so shallow that like when these things start happening, we don't even know the need of that redemption. We say, well, you made your bed, go sleep in it. You made the bad decisions. You did that. You, whatever, unlucky for you. I don't want to mess up my diligence and my life and what I've done for you. And yet that's exactly what God does for us. It's exactly what God does. It's God that sacrifices for us. He could look at us and say, you made your bed. Go sleep in it. You did this to yourself, right? Couldn't God say that to us? Did God force any of you to rebel against him or to sin yesterday or last week or this morning? He didn't make you do that, right? You did that of your own volition. And God could say, but he doesn't because he's a redeeming God. He loves us. And this is why it's the good news Because it's through his son that he redeems. Jesus is the ticket that he redeems and he purchases us back. Go go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him, Jesus, we have redemption Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Grace, undeserved merit, undeserved favor. God's undeserved favor towards you didn't say, well, deal with it yourself. Figure it out. Clean up your life. Just be better. You should just be like me and don't ever sin. And he doesn't. Instead, what what happens? Jesus redeems us. He purchases us by what? His blood. That was the just punishment he absorbed for you, for me. Your sins, my sins, our rebellion, the fact that we steal God's breath and we sing our own song, that we, that we run out of his house and we walk our own roads, all those things that we just sang, like, like that is the defining characteristic of our lives, isn't it? We, we, try to, we try to align with God for a bit of time, specifically on Sunday mornings, and then we, and then we stray. And we live and do and say and, and our own things, and then we, we come back. And then we stray, and we come back. And, and that's true. And God knows it's true. There's nobody that stays. You will stay in eternity. (laughs) But as long as we live in the sinful flesh, right? Like we're always going to be doing this. And so we need God redeeming us and bringing us back. Every day we need to be redeemed. And it's Jesus who secured that redemption. And so Boaz is this redeeming character right he's the one that's showing us 
what this model of God's characteristic is. This narrative isn't just about some dude named Boaz, and they're like, hey, be like Boaz. That's not the point. The point is that we see Boaz, and we see the characteristic of God, and we see this redemption, and we go, man, would I do that? Does God do that for me? All right, pick it up in verse 11. The people respond here. So they say, we are witnesses. And it says, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house, Ruth, like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. So let me just pause there for a second. Like, she's a Moabite. Ruth's the Moabite. She's not part of Israel. And so the, the women and everybody are like, like, come, like, she is being adopted into Israel here. Like, may she be like Rachel and Leah. Like, would she just have kids and like build up the house of Israel? Like, like you, like, that God would use her and all of this. Like, this is great and beautiful and redeeming. And so they, they assimilate her into Israel in this beautiful way here. It says, may you act worthily in a, Man, I practiced this one. Ephratha. We'll go with that. Um, See, if I can ring it off my lips, nobody would question it, right? But if I pause. Ephratha, and be renowned in Bethlehem. I'll just do a quick word study. Ephratha, like, it's only mentioned twice in the Bible, and it's, it's basically delineating where, which Bethlehem. There were two Bethlehems. It means, like, house of bread, I think. Um, and so... Um, and so there's two of them, so it's just defining where that is. Anyway, there's nothing really of significance there. Verse 12, and may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. I think God finds humor in creating references to this stuff. I will just leave it at this. You can go read Genesis 38 on your own um, and read about Tamar and Judah it's scandalous to say the least, okay? Perez is the offspring of that relationship, okay? Um, in, horribly in sin. Um, but Perez, um, God uses him to redeem Israel, right? Like, like when you read through the genealogy of Jesus, right? Like there's all sorts of scandalous things going on in there. What's the point? If it was all prim and proper, if everybody was like this perfect, they made all the right decisions, what would that lead you to conclude? Like, well, if God's going to use me, I guess i got to be perfect. Like, he doesn't. Like, why? Because God wants us to know that he redeems us, that he fixes our mistakes, right? That he purchases us back. And so Perez, God redeems some pretty scandalous things between Judah and Tamar. I know you guys are all reading Genesis 38 right now, but, um, but I'm not going there. Um, so... Um, and Perez was Boaz's great, 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 great grandfather. So like, like this is the lineage, okay? And we, we actually, we'll see this here in a second, okay? Verse 13. So it's all done. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, now Naomi pops back into this picture, right? We, we kind of gravitated away from Naomi for a while and we were focused on Boaz and Ruth and it says, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Why is this in there? <laughs> okay, cool. So Naomi, right? Like, God doesn't even forget about Naomi, right? He's, he's, he's fixed Ruth's tragedy. She's now remarried. Boaz has a wife. They've purchased property. Boaz has uh, revealed to us what, what a redeeming relationship looks like. Everything's looking good. But then there's still Naomi. And so we see at the end of this that, that Boaz's redemption of Ruth redeems Naomi in a way that, that she, she wouldn't have otherwise, right? Like she would have been like kind of left behind. It's as if like God buttons all this up. 
Like at the end of the story, it's all fixed. You're like, it's like the end of Job, right? You're like, it's all fixed. It's all done. Everything worked out. That's not chance. That's not luck. That's God's providence and God's sovereignty. And so we go all the way back to Ruth chapter 1, and it starts off with the story of this woman whose husband dies and her two sons die. And we spend a lot of time talking about tragedy and what is God doing with tragedy. And we look at it, and it just hurts. And we say he's conforming it for our good and his glory. And then we read the end, and we go, was it for Ruth's good? Did it, did it work out for Ruth? Yes. What happened? What would have happened if Ruth's husband hadn't died? They'd be in Moab. Right? Like, they went to Moab. Like, would they have left Moab? But now Ruth goes to Israel. Not just to Israel, Ruth goes to Bethlehem. You see, God is using these things. And, and so what a huge blessing to Ruth. Naomi, same thing. She would have been stuck in Moab. Who, who knows what she would have done? But instead, she gets redeemed. And so we see this beautiful picture of like, yeah, actually, God really turned that tragedy into a great result. And all the while, what's he doing? He's getting the glory. He's glorified. We, we get to see who God is. We get to see his characteristics. Remember, God only pops up his name proper twice in this book. You remember the, the, the very beginning? What did God do? Anybody remember this one? It's a quiz. He sent the famine, right? It's the only time the narrator mentions God. There's two. He, he sends the famine. And he causes Ruth to conceive. That's it. Right? And so God, like, the author really understands that, like, like God jumps in this, in this very sovereign place to make two very important things happen. All right, verse 13. Sorry, we already read that. Let's go to verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name. I find that interesting. My commentary didn't say anything about that. But I'm like, the, the, the women of the neighborhood named your kid? I guess, all right. Saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashalon. Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Why did we say that twice at the end? <laughs> Why? What's the point of this book? They're, they're starting with David. They're, they're, they're starting with David, who is the king through which the Messiah is going to come. And so the author of this book is starting with David. And at the end of this thing, he wants to make sure everybody understands that, that this, these things led to David. It led to David. That is the purpose. Now go to Matthew chapter 1. Here we go. We're going to read a genealogy. Not the whole thing. Don't worry. I'll skip some. Matthew chapter 1, verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez. And Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And skip down to verse 16. It keeps going and going. Verse 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Does it sound like God was just rolling the dice to see what would happen? Does it seem like God just like left it up to human will and just 
watching what we're doing? No. God is sovereign in all of this. And he's making these things happen. But we cannot forget that there's a narrative going on, right? Boaz doesn't see this. He doesn't see this picture that we see, right? He doesn't know that his grandson is going to be David. Naomi doesn't know this. Ruth doesn't know this. So what's characteristic of them? They're just living life. They're just making decisions. And they have no idea the impact of their decisions or how God is going to use them. And that's the same for us. There's no difference. Although your story isn't going to be in the Bible. Promise? Okay? But that doesn't mean God isn't using your lives, your actions, your relationships to reveal himself to this world. We have to see that connection. God could have had some theological treaties about how he redeems and just tell us a bunch of facts. But that's not how he does it. He tells us stories, narrative, and people living life and God using their actions, good and bad, their decisions, good and bad, faithless and faithful, and he redeems them and he conforms them. And so that should be our prayer. As we go out and we're living our lives, that, that God is going to redeem them and that we're going to take every opportunity we can to live faithfully, to decide faithfully, to act faithfully, to have relationships that are deep enough that we can reveal Christ in them. I think I read this too often, but I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 5.20 because I just love this verse. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. God is imploring this world through you and through me. That's how he's doing it. He doesn't communicate to people in lightning bolts. He communicates to them in your coffee conversations, in your water cooler talk, in your, right? Like, this is how he works. And so we really need to elevate what we see and the, the significance of those discussions we're having. Every relationship we have, we need to take it seriously and invest in it and see the gravity with which we are ambassadors for Christ. Let me pray.